Hello, I'm Rachel Patton, Executive Director of Preserve Arkansas. Preserve Arkansas is the statewide nonprofit advocate for historic preservation. Welcome to our Women in Preservation virtual speaker series. Last Saturday, June 5th, Preserve Arkansas celebrated its 40th anniversary. We're especially pleased to have Dr. Goodstein Murphy as our speaker today for multiple reasons but in particular because she will reflect on her 40 plus year career in the preservation field, much of that being here in Arkansas. She was involved with the Historic Preservation Alliance of Arkansas, now known as Preserve Arkansas, in its earliest days, and we look forward to hearing her talk. This project is generously supported by DMX Architecture in Fayetteville. Thank you to DMX. Now some quick housekeeping items for you. Please type your questions for Dr. Goodstein Murphy into the Q&A box and she will answer those live at the end of her presentation. Please use the chat to make comments and visit with other participants in the webinar. But if you have a question that you'd like to be answered, please put it into the Q&A box. Thank you. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker. Ethel Goodstein Murphy is Professor of Architecture and Associate Dean of the University of Arkansas Bay Jones School of Architecture and Design, where she has taught since 1992. In a career spanning more than four decades, she has practiced architecture in New York City, served as architectural historian for the Arkansas Historic Preservation Program and taught at the University of Louisiana. She holds a Bachelor of Architecture degree from City College of New York, an MA in the History of Architecture and Preservation Planning from Cornell University, and a PhD in History of Architecture and American Cultural Studies from the University of Michigan. A distinguished scholar and teacher, Dr. Goodstein is recognized for inspiring emerging architects, interior designers, and landscape architects to engage history as a lens through which the wicked problems of the present can be better understood and to imbue design thinking with an ethical regard for works of the past. A specialist in American architectural and cultural history, her current work engages mid-century modernism, its preservation, and the roles of women in its chronicle. Equally important, her work has told Arkansas's architectural story and the challenges of preserving it to a national audience. An advocate of sustaining balance in the made environment, Goodstein Murphy has served on historic district commissions in Arkansas and Louisiana, and on the board of directors of Preserve Arkansas. Her efforts to protect Arkansas's historic architecture have been acknowledged by Preserve Arkansas with its Parker Westbrook Award for Lifetime Achievement. Recognition of her teaching and scholarship include an American Institute of Architects Education Honors Award, the Louisiana Preservation Alliance Award for Excellence in Preservation Education, the Tau Sigma Delta Silver Medal, and the Arkansas AIA Award of Merit. In service to the profession, Goodstein Murphy has held leadership positions in the Association of Collegiate Schools of Architecture and the Southeast Chapter of the Society of Architectural Historians. Please welcome Dr. Ethel Goodstein Murphy. Thank you, Rachel. And let's see if we have any luck whatsoever in screen sharing, because what is anyone who talks about the made environment without their slides. So bear with me. And let's see what we get. Rachel, are we there? Yes, you look good. All right, super. So we will formally commence. Again, my thanks to Rachel. My thanks to the entire Preserve Arkansas board, and in particular for Tim Maddox and DMX for their generous sponsorship of this important series. To tell you the truth, I hate introductions. When I go to the podium, 
and I go to the podium way too often. It's never about me. It's about a specific lesson to be learned about who creates the made environment. Or it's about the places that demonstrate the fragile intersections of identity and inclusion in the made and natural environment. Sometimes it's about making a point to steward my school, to save a place, to forge better design thinking in the community. Once in a while, it's even about a cultural phenomenon that brings me joy. Further, some might argue that I am not in easily introduced. I'm an historian of design with significant work in Anglo-American culture and architectural theory. I'm a preservation planner and advocate. I'm a design educator and administrator. By some standards, I'm a prolific and eclectic author. My first publication was about a Gothic revival chapel. My next dissects Faye Jones's women clients. But I could do none of this without my roots in the ways of knowing and the ways of working that only a professional training in architecture can provide. With all of that said, today I will fold a little more of me into backwards and forwards glances at preservation design and practice than I usually do. After all, this is a series about women in preservation, a topic in which chronology counts. Just so you know, this woman deposited her first check from an architectural internship in 1972, did her first standing structure survey in Ithaca, New York in 1975, and first met the made environment of Arkansas with AHPP in 1979. She ran to academia about three years later and never looked back. You can do the math. I don't want to. But the point is I have been a woman in preservation and by important extension, a woman in architecture for damn near one half century. And there are stories to tell about coming of age in design, about the evolution of preservation agendas and theories, and about how we educate the emerging generation of designers to do the good and necessary work of protecting, stewarding, and designing resilient historic places. I offer my own histories, not as architectural or a biography, but as departure points for prospect and reflection on the occasion of the 40th anniversary of Preserve Arkansas. To begin, I'm compelled to unpack some of the baggage that comes with being a woman in architecture, old school. Cultural historian and linguist John McWhorter has gotten a lot of attention recently. Some of you might have caught him on Bill Maher a couple of weeks ago for his highly charged comments regarding the anti-racism movement. Seeking a sense of measurement for a relational understanding between race relations in the 1960s and the horrors of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, among so many others, he bemoans an absence of the tempering forces of history. In short, he's a little wary of voices for change that come with protagonists too young to remember the way it was. He's equally unsure about the long-term ramifications of cancel culture for a generation to whom events are not real if they don't happen in the now you see it, now you don't world of Instagram. This really struck a chord for me because for a long time, I've felt quite similarly about gender equity and inclusion in the profession. As long as I can remember, I was told that I could do anything that I wanted to do and be anything that I wanted to be, but I'd have to fight like a bad dog to do it and probably do it better than the boys did just to get in the front door. 
couple of object lessons. Were it not for overt discrimination in the design and tech sectors during the post-war period, I wouldn't be here to talk to you today. No question about it. My mother, an electrical engineer, designed fail-safe systems for battleships during the Second World War, hit a glass ceiling after men returned from World War II, no challenging projects, no promotions, no legal recourse. My father was really good looking and whoops, stuff happens. She would have gotten that promotion to materials testing. Somebody else would be talking to you today, I promise. And so began the journey, which during my mom's short sabbatical from the workforce revolved around the Brooklyn Museum and Prospect Park, McKim Meaden White and Frederick Law Olmsted were better friends than anyone I met at preschool. Until puberty ruined it, on Sundays, my daddy would sit me down at the then men only bar at the Montauk Club of Venetian Revival Wonder and explain that I could be there because I wasn't like other girls. I learned how to read a plan early on too the byproduct of regular house hunting trips to Long Island, which fortunately came to naught, for who could live more than a 30 minute subway ride from the city? Not Shirley Goodstein and not any child that she bore. In short, I was a spoiled only child who liked to go to a room to draw, paint and mess around with my plastic bricks. I lived for the monthly delivery of shelter magazines and fashion magazines, but both at home and in the painfully wanting offices of New York City public school guidance counselors, the message was clear. Smart girls don't paint. Making clothes is beneath you. Yes, we understand you're not so crazy about people, but you're good at science. You could be a veterinarian. Thank the powers of the universe for my 10th grade painting teacher, Jack Biller, may you rest in peace, who watching how I organized a canvas one day made the ultimately life-changing observation. You know, you'd make a great architect. And then the fighting like a bad dog on some days manipulating the situation like a savvy lap cat on others began in earnest. It was a given that I would not leave New York City for college, at least not the first time. Museums, ballet, the only decent pizza in North America. Why go? I had choices. I was accepted to Cooper Union and Pratt and the City University where I ended up. And I thrived in that program. And looking back, I wonder if it was because there was a strong and dedicated urban agenda. At CCNY's architecture school, under the leadership of a visionary Dean Bernie Spring, the mantra was, we don't do ski houses in Vermont. And it was powerful. And again, looking back, I'm sure it was the foundation, maybe tacit, but still a foundation of the call later in life to preservation design and an enduring commitment to social justice in architecture. Youngsters, please note, 2020 did not invent the notion of social justice. At the point of Dr. McWhorter, a few key facts for those of you who only know 1969 from the three disc Woodstock vinyl or the Dirty Dancing flick. Please take note. There were architecture programs to which I could not apply because I was a woman. Statistics of the American Institute of Architects suggest that in 1973, 8% of the architecture students in the United States were women. If you look at the statistics of my class, it was more like 6%, but who's gonna mince a couple of percentage points? I was regularly told by classmates that if I had your fill in the part of the anatomy that you think they were talking about, 
I get A's too. Speaking of A's, the congratulations, you're on Dean's List letters that I received every semester were addressed to Mr. Goodstein, although Mrs. Robinson, the Dean's secretary, knew damn well who I was. Rumor had it that I would only go to coffee or lunch with professors. By the way, only two of them were women, both incredible practitioners, Judy Edelman and Phyllis Berkeley. Oh, neither was tenure tracked, both were adjuncts. Hmm, that much was true. There wasn't a whole lot to learn from my classmates, or at least so I thought. And I understood early on that access to power and access to knowledge were important. I wasn't going to let any false propriety stand in my way of getting it. Although I consumed a rich menu of architectural and urban history classes, preservation was not on the bill of fare. Introducing the topic of adaptive use didn't go well. And when I proposed a preservation-based thesis, the response was, what? You're just going to gut an old building? Obviously, I did not do a preservation-based thesis. I left architecture school just as the clouds of the 1974 recession broke open and poured trouble all over the building industry. Again, youngsters, 2008 was not the first recession that wreaked havoc on architects. I had a great portfolio with a solid detail sheet, a minor in Renaissance art and a position in real estate development, doing low rise, high density housing, and learning the business of building. To this day, my then boss tells me, you're a designer, I made you an architect. Maybe he did, maybe he didn't, but it's the nicest thing that anyone ever said about me. Despite the difficult social histories of the 1970s, these formative experiences were foundational, transformative and enduring. So, where's the swerve to preservation? It's not an accident that there are way too many photographs of me stroking the eye sections of mid-century modern buildings floating around Facebook and Instagram. Granted, there are even more slides of me in obscure Romanesque chapels, but I don't have the copyright to those. The mid-century modern is a handy icon for who I am and what I do. Remember my dates. I was trained in the waning years of the modern movement. We started with a grid and believed that everything would just fall into place and be spectacular after that. Even though Robert Venturi's complexity and contradiction with its refreshing perspective that predecessor, predecessor aesthetics ought to influence design thinking, with that book on the shelves and gaining traction, things might have changed, but a tacit disdain for pre-modern architecture remained very real. I always recall that the first most important ever lecture I attended was delivered by one of the fathers of modernism, architect Marcel Breuer at the New York chapter of the American Institute of Architects, no less. What was Breuer talking about? It's 1971. He was defending his proposed tower that would have consumed Grand Central Station. They can sing about the day that the music died. I talk about the day the modernism died. Although the tide would soon turn away from orthodox modernism, there are a lot of really bad buildings constructed in the 1970s. I know, I know, they're all 50 years old now and uh, everybody's in back and forth challenging who's, should they be on the National Register? Should they not be on the National Register? But those early manifestations of the debates of what would follow modernism did not inspire. In the end, 
Though postmodernism led to a departure from Poirier of modern design, it contributed little to the aesthetic or ethics of preservation. Other things did. The memory of walking through a partially demolished Penn Station, the loss of the Jefferson Market Courthouse, and the urban promise of the newly revitalized South Street Seaport. There's the swerve. In the end, probing the dilemmas of heritage politics and changing urban futures through negotiation of modernism's formal discontinuities and preservation's demand for cultural continuity did not take me to a refined preservation design practice. In an era of increasing professionalism and professionalization of historic preservation, it propelled me toward two more highly specialized academic degrees, followed by an array of law courses audited and too many continuing education credits to count in everything from public policy to sedimentary stone. No, it don't come easy. Uncertain of the best home for the hybridized breed of architect, preservationist, and historian that I had become, I was drawn to test my sensibilities in a then very foreign place. Arkansas. When I tell my friends in New York, taking a new position, they'd ask, where are you going? or they usually ask, who are you going to? The connotation being, whose office are you going to? And I'd say, Arkansas. And they'd say, seriously? No, really, where are you going? And I'd say, Arkansas. And maybe when they started to dial an area code with 501 in front of it, they believed that I could leave the center of Northeastern built culture. 1979, oh, it's a long time ago. And although I'm fearful that memories of my first date with Arkansas architecture, as I call my time at AHPP, may be subject to far too much revisionist history in the company of Preserve Arkansas, they can't be ignored. For nearly three years, with the lofty title of architectural historian as designed by the feds, I interfaced with three teams that were then the blood and guts of AHPP, Technical Preservation Services, National Register, and Survey. I learned the names of all 75 counties, traveling to most of them to discover many hidden treasures. It was then that enduring love affairs began with the Medical Arts Building, the Royston House, the Nashville Pers Presbyterian Church, and of course the Garden Mitchell House of which I occupied the southeastern quarter of the second floor for some time. Equally important for what has become a lifetime south and west of Brooklyn, I came to understand that a dog and a pony show was something that did not require the institutional infrastructure of the Westminster Kennel Club, concluded that eating a nasty bottom feeder like catfish, fried no less, wouldn't kill you or send you directly to hell, and was instructed in how to say y'all, a pronunciation that according to some people, I have never perfected. That's why you hear me saying, you people, most of the time. I wrote or edited a lot of National Register nominations. My favorites may have been Man and Stern's Terminal Warehouse Building. I'd argue, looking back, the most important, the nomination of the Dunbar School in Little Rock and maybe the most fun and funkiest, the Bank of Kingston in Madison County. I was on the periphery of restoration and adaptive use endeavors that set impeccable standards for the state and arguably for the nation. 
the Capitol Hotel, project on which I met, Ed Cromwell, very special person for our state's legacy. The Pulaski County Courthouse Rotunda Restoration model case of partnerships across government, state and local. And the early development of the historic Washington State Park. And I picked this slide remembering many, many conversations with Charles Witzel about how to create a proper fence and an early awareness that it's not just the building, it's the cultural landscape that makes any sense of place, but especially so in Arkansas. I also learned that arriving at the most agreeable solutions for preservation planning and urban revitalization came at a cost. Can you say Marion Hotel? The slide says it all. Designed by George R. Mann, 1905 to seven, imploded February 17th, 1980 a story that deserves its own lecture, a story that Rex Nelson has told in the Encyclopedia of Arkansas, and there's more to say, and a, a story that my husband has physically prevented me from telling in the Capitol Hotel bar too many times to count when he has physically restrained me from informing some, oh, happy reveler who says, didn't there used to be a different hotel across the street about neoclassicism, George Mann, and preservation economics. But again, I want to build the larger and in the end more useful context. Trigger warning, I might hurt some feelings with what is about to follow. These are times when the official stories that were recorded in preservation often were exclusionary, absent of linkages between the past and the critical present. While I always admired the ways in which community preservation advocates embraced their beloved buildings, there was always that little skepticism about the Spo office the work of historic preservation in the state had the gloss of elitism and privilege and not getting what happened at the grassroots. Then, frankly, we were not generous in the review of Tax Act projects or grant recipients that veered from the Secretary of Interior Standards. We were still shaky in evaluating the lines between restoration, renovation, adaptive use, and oh, heaven help us additions to historic structures. Oh, we were naive about access for disabilities. While there was profound mutual respect among state management in historic preservation, historic archaeology, and natural resources, in the end, our practices were siloed. And then there was the cult of what style is it? We could rant superficially about whether Art Deco storefronts were significant enough or old enough to warrant National Register recognition. Everybody loved the vernacular, but nobody read Henry Glassy. For the record, the gender piece was less potent in my life world by now, but on the tech services side, I did have a lexicon of threats all with dollar signs attached to them, for contractors who thought that the demands of the preservation person were particularly negligible when the preservation person was a she. We won't even talk about that old stereotype of the preservationist as the little old blue haired lady in sneakers. You remember when it was there, or at least some of you do. Good times? Hmm. Inevitably, 
My conviction that preservation required deeper structures of history and theory that could relieve mainstream preservation's prescriptive guidelines and exclusionary narratives made my direction pivot once again to a different kind of research than that which makes the state office tick, to teaching and in the fullness of time to the dark side known as academic administration. To balance the narrative of the very beginning, I'm gonna to rush to the here and now. Yeah, that means ignoring chapters, important chapters that include the writing of three preservation ordinances in two different states, 10 amazing years in Louisiana. We're also going to skip over the inability of a certain city in Northwest Arkansas to create overlay districts that would give its historic district mission some teeth. Well, <clears throat> neither hail the salvation of Carnal Hall, nor grieve the loss of Carlson Terrace at least not today. And a short lecture doesn't allow me to extol the talents of the extraordinary students that I have come to know in these 39 plus years, a good number of whom have emerged as influential preservation designers, advocates, and historians. Rachel, am I still on? Hi, Ethel. It, it went off just a second ago, and I asked, I asked it to restart, and it did, but now I see that fuzzy black screen that we were seeing earlier. Uh-oh. Okay, but now I'm seeing something. Now I see you. You're on the laptop. Okay, well, we're just gonna have to, we're just gonna have to go. Oh, all right, you got a slide? That's yeah, yeah. okay. Ah, at least it went off at a good break point. <laughs> so, from the past to the present and virtual life. My critical present is the Fei Jung School of Architecture and Design. As Associate Dean of the school, in productive partnership with Dean Peter McKee, I have the good problems of facilitating remarkably good work by extraordinarily good people, including meaningful research, teaching, and outreach in historic preservation and cultural resource management. At the risk of boring any Faye Jones School alumni who are in the audience, I do want to start with some basics. Another trigger warning. So doing entertains my fear that what happens in Fayetteville, especially when it happens off the baseball diamond or the football field, stays in Fayetteville all too often. We are not the architecture school. We are called the architecture school frequently. We abbreviate as ARC, but we are not the architecture school. We are the school of architecture and design, and it's important. The change reflects recognition of our multidisciplinary environment, that includes undergraduate professional programs in architecture, landscape architecture, and interior design, as well as liberal education programs in architectural studies and landscape architectural studies. We offer minor areas of study in history of architecture and design, planning, and sustainability. For the record, 
I can point to graduates in each of those programs who have entered and succeeded in discrete careers in historic preservation. In some cases, built design practices around fervent commitments to protecting and stewarding the main natural environments. You know who you are. At the risk of speaking prematurely, we expect to be the College of Architecture and Design by the end of the next academic year, the conclusion of our 75th anniversary celebration. Why college? Why now? When we ask what the work of the school should be or must be, we think about the dichotomies and the challenges that come with environmental and architectural evolution across the state and the responsibility to take on those wicked problems. We're not just in the studios. We have outreach centers, a community design center, a resiliency center that addresses challenges of food, water, and community systems. We have our fabulous Garvin Woodland Gardens in Hot Springs. Our leadership in innovation and sustainable timber and wood design soon will add the Anthony Timberland Center for Design and Material Innovation to our portfolio. And since 2018, we have offered a post-professional pan-disciplinary graduate degree, the Master of Design Studies. More about that shortly. And not to forget keeping the women in the conversation, fostering an inclusive environment for teaching and learning that promotes diversity and equity forms the core of our design culture. Last year, the school's enrollment topped 700, an historic surge that we'd like to equate with visibility of the power of the design professions to affect change. Last spring, 63.5% of those students identified as female, an 80% increase since 2014. And please put your preconceived notions away. The difference was not made by the addition of interior design to the school in 2010. It's across all three disciplines, including architecture, which is within a few hundredths of a percentage point away from having a flat 50-50 ratio of students who identify as female to students who identify as male. Through the tenacious advocacy of our dean, the school is recognized as a source of wisdom on campus planning and building. And we'd like to believe that that had a great deal to do with the awarding of three significant campus commissions to female-led practices. The Adohi Housing Community by Andrea Lears in collaboration with our local partners, Moda Studio, and their project lead, Leanne Barabo. The Anthony Timberland Center by the Pritzker Prize winning Grafton Architects about to break ground October-ish. And for this audience, I know you share my excitement as we await uh, the first glimpse of plans by Deborah Burke, whose firm, Deborah Burke Partners, will handle responsibly, I am quite sure, the renovation of the greatest mid-century modern building, the most significant international style building in Arkansas, Stones University of Arkansas Fine Arts Center. And I lost my screen again. There we go. Okay. Um, this is good news and it's brought us some great attention. Uh, all of this All of this earned us a lead article in this month's AIA Architect magazine. And it's the combination 
of the commissions, of the numbers, of the recognition gives our emerging women designers a portrait of a future that I never could have envisioned as an undergraduate. As the article says, and I quote, at the Faye Jones School, tomorrow's architects are coming of age in an environment where sustainable and equitable design are at the forefront and women are in the driver's seat. I'm well aware that some members of our audience find the historic absence of a dedicated degree path to historic preservation in the Faye Jones School unacceptable. Quite to the contrary, I always will argue that one of the obligations of professional training is to imbue design thinking with an ethical regard for works of the past. We are above all things a design school. We solve problems with design. We hope we provoke change with design. All designers, not just those who aspire to be full-time, full tilt to start preservationists, require a competent critical exposure to the roles of history and heritage in design decision-making. What does it mean to be a school in a state with incredible historic cultural resources and built heritage? What it means is made palpable to our students every day that they enter their campus home, the Val Walker Hall that some of you remember, the old university library, and the Stephen L. Anderson Design Center a project, a set of structures that were purpose built to embody object lessons in negotiating the past and the present for our students. It's visible too in the model lesson of restoration uh, that our students have come to know since we uh, acquired the home of Faye and Gus Jones, generously endowed to us by his daughters, Cammie and Janice we have been involved in a meticulous restoration uh, of the house. The uh, exterior envelope and vertical surfaces are all in good order. The grotto is restored to its original glory and a dry glory, uh, I am happy to say. And again, our partner firm, Hyde Jackson, is led, and this project was led by Gail. Hyatt Shepherd, another one of our alumni who happens to have two X chromosomes. Our next horizon here is an interior refurbishment that will involve restoring furnishings uh, original to the house and reproducing uh, some additional fittings. Stay tuned and if you're in Fayetteville and you want to visit, give me a buzz. One of my few perks as Associate Dean is knowing the code to getting into the Faye Jones house. Further, I'll always argue that historic preservation skills and sensibilities are essential components of ordinary practices. Some cultures get this better than others, and it's one of the reasons we send our kids to Rome or Mexico or Japan. And it doesn't hurt if you can't go to Val Walker Hall and the Anderson Center every day to go to a 17th century palazzo. You get your history whether you want it or not. And that ethos of seeing the making and shaping of spaces and places through the lenses of history is imbued throughout the undergraduate curriculums. In history of architecture and design, in an array of studio projects that take on addition, adaptive use, documentation, and rescuing of endangered commercial structures, not to mention interface with the communities that these projects serve. We consistently see honors capstone work that takes on critical problems of preservation at all scales of all periods. And yes, those are my kids. 
those are species that I supervise, unless you're wondering what I really do when I'm not doing all that administrative stuff. And we even have seminars that deal with um, history and preservation and curatorship and what we hope are creative ways. And you know, once in a while they do let me teach. I'm gonna be careful because time is short, uh, but this last semester, my mid-century modern seminar, uh, took on the challenge to create an exhibition of uh, exemplars from two collections of Fulbright Industries furniture designed by Edward Durrell Stone, uh, 49 to 51, that again, the school has uh, come to own. And one of my groups of students did this absolutely wacky, crazy, fun proposition of what if you show the Faye Jones furniture, uh, the Faye Jones house with the Ed Stone furniture. Again, stay tuned. We're trying to make this happen in the next year. So I hope this suggests, demonstrates, and verifies that historic preservation doesn't need a mantle. It needs to be in the DNA of the designer. Transforming a building, a place, or a space offers an opportunity to tell multiple stories, linking the past and the present, and potentially creating a more inclusive environment. But who's going to design that environment? Who's gonna do the work? Who's gonna interpret the Secretary of Interior standards? Who's gonna transform a section 106 review into brick and mortar or steel and glass as the case may be? It's gonna be an architect, probably working with an interior designer. And if they really have it going on with a landscape architect in the mix. When we determine that the greater good would be served by offering a concentration in preservation design in our new, still new, Master of Design Studies curriculum, that was our principal objective, to enable individuals with design training and experience to do the work. We had hoped to have the concentration launched and ready to go this coming fall. Little thing like a global pandemic got in the way, so we will be offering that degree option for the first time in fall of 22. It's a good thing because we're smarter now than we were a year and a half ago, two years ago. Smarter because despite the glitches that you're seeing today, we can deliver the body of knowledge that comes from a designer's perspective of preservation virtually and reach more prospective students, have the ability to, to provide continuing education as an outgrowth of the degree. And we've all made it through an eye-opening year that reminds us that there are many heritages to be celebrated, that those things that make Arkansas places resilient, vital, and inclusive need to be understood in a special spirit of recognition. I will just give you a quick glimpse of what this degree structure will look like. Uh, I spend a lot of time talking curriculum. I sit on a lot of committees that talk about curriculum. I don't want to put anybody to sleep here. It happens. But I do want to point out, at the risk of being redundant, that what we want to do here is to equip the next generation of designers to do much more than make beautiful and functional spaces and places. Assuming leadership in the state as the state's land grant means proving that design matters and solving the wicked problems that cities, rural communities, and even ex-urban enclaves like Northwest Arkansas face. 
So our preservation design curriculum is conceived within a set of companion programs in resiliency design, retail and hospitality design, and integrated wood design. We will have housing design and health and wellness design coming online soon too. And the center of all of these concentrations is actual work, doing it, problem solving, hands-on in advanced design studios and sharing mutual perspectives of inquiry and leadership, supported of course by an incredible array of electives, many of which I hope to teach when I stop being an associate dean, may the time come. It's an important sense of interrelationships for thinking about contemporary preservation design. Because so let's think about it. Mm. Hospitality and retail design. I'd argue the best hotels. I was at one last week in a Louis Sullivan building in St. Louis. Are restorations of significant structures. So to retail. How can you think about resilience and sustainability without thinking of preservation? Icomos's 2015 Paris Charter makes very clear that the business of preservation has to think of cultural landscape and heritage in terms of the natural world and age old sustainable practices. So our slightly cartoonish, but incredibly well meant diagram of relationships and interrelationships to commemorate the school on its 75th birthday makes very clear that preservation is an essential link in a larger chain of thinking, making, and doing. All in all, these are good and productive times for historic preservation. Let's think about this for a moment. Notre Dame Paris burned and all of a sudden, everyone became a preservation advocate. I got texts from in-laws who don't usually talk to me to want to wanted to know more about what was gonna happen to Notre Dame. Prada hires Rem Coolhouse to brand its boutiques and showcase its arts and reimagine storefronts and factories alike. And suddenly preservation is cool. And closer to home, the patronage of Alice Walton transformed a redundant cheese processing factory into a cutting edge facility for contemporary fine and performing arts. And my footnote here again, the lead designer on the project Callie Verkamp for Wheeler Kearns, 2014 Faye Jones grad, oops, two X chromosomes. And as we think about what these futures are, when we take those last 40 years of Preserve Arkansas and project ahead to the next 40 years, not just in Arkansas, but in the nation and in the world, how can we not think about the connections of climate change and cultural heritage. I didn't do this to you, but the very last slide I show in my 20th century history class, a class required of all architecture and interior design students, is not a building. It's a slide of a polar bear on an ice floe in a rapidly melting natural environment. If we can't preserve for our communities, if we can't preserve to create identity, if we can't preserve for the sheer joy of recognizing the land and the brilliance of the designers and indigenous peoples who have given it meaning in built and spatial form. If we can't preserve that for future generations and for that polar bear that I'm not showing you. 
what then really can we do? Some scholars of preservation will bemoan that our theory is still trapped in the bonds of 19th century intellectual roots, poo-pooing William Morris and Violet Le Duke. Maybe so, but in one regard, Violet Le Duke, a thought leader in that formative discourse was right. In the late 1860s, he wrote, the word restoration and the thing itself are modern. To restore a building is not to maintain it or repair it or rebuild it. It is to reestablish it in a complete state that might never have existed at any other moment. Indeed, preservation design saves architecture and great spaces and remarkable natural environments from obsolescence. Simultaneously, those places and spaces are framed and reframed by preservation intervention everywhere is imbued with cultural significance, born of the past, but also fully connected to the present. Every contemporary designer needs to know that. And that's what I make it my business to do, make sure that no aspiring designer passes through the Faye Jones School of Architecture without having preservation on their plate. Not as an extra, not as a value added, but as the blood and guts of what designers do. All right, I think Rachel has a plan for how we tie this up and tear this down. Yes, thank you, Ethel. What an excellent talk. And we appreciate everything that, that you and all of the instructors at the Faye Jones School do to instill a preservation ethic in our next generation of architects. Let's see, I'm going to, if you'll stop sharing your screen, Ethel, please. Okay, I can do that, I think. Okay, and they can see us better. Mm -hmm. And it looks like here's a question. Okay, can I read that? It, I'll read it to you. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. It <laughs> says, in relation to the graduate degree, can you describe what graduate residency entails? It's a good, it's a good question. Graduate residency is um, the working person's alternative to a good old fashioned written thesis. Uh, we want through their methods and leadership classes, students to identify a specific challenge or problem that they wish to research and play through in a design uh, solution. We are hoping that we will be able to cultivate opportunities with our peers um, in firms, uh, with our partners in uh, the state, with our partners in uh, the Department of the Interior, uh, as well as some opportunities that looks like are gonna break loose in Rome uh, so that our students can have a, a residency that's a little bit of a mixture of an independent research and an internship uh, in the broadest sense it's our hope that this will be an experience from which both the prospective uh, preservationist and the host firm or agency uh, can prosper and grow. Um, 
And yes, that's a plea to my friends in practice that if you've got some preservation stuff cooking and you think uh, mm, that summer 23, we're gonna need somebody to work with us, oh, call me, I'll answer. Uh, we're also at our Rome Center uh, under the leadership of its new director, Francesco Badeschi, who is a leader both in uh, sustainability in Greenville, Europe, uh, and very active in preservation uh, advocacy uh, as well. Uh, we're working with him to see if we can do a variation on the residency that will involve a study abroad component for um, the, the um, degree seekers. Thank you. We've got some more questions. Next, are there any books that you would like to write or places that you would like to research but just don't have the time? <laughs> oh, that's a sensitive question. <laughs> Uh, you know, I, 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 have, I have been doing the, 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 uh, the administrative side long enough that, uh, believe it or not, I find myself mentoring people who are just coming over to the dark side. And uh, unfortunately, the thing that I say most often is, now you're going to have to put your own stuff on the side for a while. And, oh, that hurts. Um, I say, I, in truth of fact, I have... Um, three manuscripts in various phases. One is a manuscript that addresses the work of Edward Durrell Stone. And since it has been long in evolving and uh, the both salvation and loss of so many of Mr. Stone's works uh, has been in current dialogue. We see our own fine arts center um, getting great attention. I've yet to visit again, something else to blame on the pandemic, uh, Stephen Hull's addition to the Kennedy Center uh, in DC. Uh, lots, lots of work to be seen. So that is going to talk, um, really evolution of that manuscript is monitoring um, my evolution. It will not only be a look at post-war era designs by Stone, but with um, focus on what's happened to the works, preservation and loss, and also focus on collaborative practices. Uh, Stone doesn't get the credit that he deserves uh, as being someone who, since the 1930s, uh, worked in serious partnerships with interior designers, landscape architects, uh, like Tom Church, the inventor of the kidney-shaped pool, a uh, plethora of uh, interior designers, including some women. Uh, so there's a lot to be said there, that's one. Um, on the plus side, I was looking for the plus sides of aging. You know, you get to a point where you say, I'm gonna do what I goddamn wanna do. Um, it's been a long time since peer review and tenure really meant a lot to me. And um, you get to indulge what you always wanted to do. And sort of around the corners of um, preservation, I come back to my first real love, um, which is fashion. And uh, I you know, ha had the, uh, the Fantasione Prada up on the screen, um, but go to Milan, go to Venice, go to Soho, and there are incredible retail spaces that have been created that are pres preserved wonderful heritage buildings, but now, oh, hot as can be, uh, bastions of fashion. Um, there, there's a fabulous museum in Milan uh, that holds the works of Giorgio Armani uh, that's made out of a series of industrial silos uh, with Tadeo Ando as um, the architect, no less. Uh, so those collisions of making space making fashion, showcasing the body, how we clothe it and how we sell it. Um, that's a subject of something that is growing. And I always threaten that I'm going to write an architectural autobiography. Now, that's not to say what I really did or didn't do to get this, that or the other job. I'm talking about things that happened before I came to Arkansas. Um, but about places, um, because again, I think we, 
some of us at any rate, I do, have an intense relationship with the places that are my heritage, many of which I have not visited. Um, I've never set foot in Kovel, Russia, right on the border of the Ukraine. It's where my maternal grandfather came from. I've never um, experienced that part of Poland, uh, which was once known as Galicia. But it's a place that is part of me. And the Brooklyn Museum and Prospect Park and so many other meaningful places. And putting together, um, again, a half century, probably by the time I get around to doing this, it'll be closer to six decades, um, of talking about buildings, working with buildings, negotiating the saving of buildings, moaning the loss of buildings. I want to talk about my architectural history. So that's the top three. I like that. Okay, you've got some more. What sorts of hands-on experiences with historic places will students enrolled in the preservation design concentration get? That's a great question. And it is going to vary semester to semester, project to project. Uh, the best, you know, the best way that I can address that is by talking about some of the things we do now. Uh, the advanced studios, remember architecture is a five year program. Uh, we have a series of advanced studios, some of which are interdisciplinary, which also include uh, senior interior design students have really started uh, to become the fertile territory for exploring the kinds of things that ultimately we will do in uh, the master's program. Uh, there will definitely be a cultural uh, resource management side of the program. Uh, I know many of you in the Alliance Permanent and Preserve Arkansas, I still call it the Alliance, um, familiar with the work of our la my landscape architecture colleague, Kimball Erdman, who has done work on uh, the roller camps, uh, has um, extended outside of the state, is doing some cutting edge work in uh, Carlsbad caverns in documentation. Documentation is going to show up in a book very soon. Uh, he has had students involved in upper level undergraduates involved in all of those projects as well as grants connected to them. Uh, he's already got um, chapter and verse on how those opportunities will um, be the stuff of which graduate studios are made. Uh, this semester we uh, had uh, in a studio led by our interior design department head, Carl Matthews, if you haven't met, you get Carl to speak. If you haven't met Carl, you need to meet Carl. Um, he, uh, working with um, some of our good colleagues in Hot Springs, uh, led his seniors loose on a series of speculative adaptive reuses um, for the Mountain Air Hotel, um, the, Hale, the Hale Bath House that he looked at, and um, some additional commercial fabric on uh, Central Avenue. Uh, over the years, I mean, we, we have done uh, projects in Pine Bluff. We have done an awful lot of, again, getting students out doing the measuring, talking to the communities. We've done work uh, in uh, the downtown square in Huntsville. So real problems uh, are very much part of the way we work. Uh, Marlon Blackwell always says, yeah, the days of doing uh, the, ho the house in the country for the blind, the blind deaf poet you know, are gone, Pol totally politically incorrect, but you, you get the point. Um, I don't think any of our training is without rootedness in hands-on and real. Uh, if hands-on means technical preservation skills, stone conservation, uh, curtain wall restoration, that will come undoubtedly in the elective coursework. I'm glad to hear that. 
Is that handy enough for hands-on? That is. Okay, you've got some more. Um, we'll just do these last two. Do you think that some buildings should be on the registry before the required age of 50 years? And can you think of some that should be placed on the registry early? So the National Register. It depends. It, it's a very good question. And, you know, as I said in my talk, I am struggling when I read the literature on preservation of postmodern buildings, preservation of uh, brutalist buildings, all of which are very much in conversation. Um, one of the things I always keep in mind, and I hope this is useful if painful, is remember modern buildings were built to last for 30 years. Uh, remember, I you know, was on the practical side of building too. And there is so much fragility in the architecture that has been built since the second half of the 20th century that that accelerated date of determination of significance has a great deal um, of meaning. The, the real problem, I think, is less about age than of how significance is going to be constructed. Uh, the, the only takeaway that I can give as a generalization is age is never going to be enough. Um, as we pay attention to um, episodes of um, social demonstration, as we pay attention to contemporary historic events, where are they happening? How are they being framed? Is that place going to continue to exist? And, you know, I think too, when, when we start to broaden the notion of preservation to be encompassing and considering indigenous practices, environmental concerns, um, I hate when people tell me age is only a number, but I'm afraid that my answer to this question is age is only a number. Okay, thank you so much, Ethel. I'm gonna show just a couple slides here mm -hmm. at the end, if y'all will stick with me just a minute. There we go. Um, we will uh, have these two lovely women next month on July 13th. I invite you to come back and join us again at 3.30 in the afternoon uh, to hear from Dr. Ruth Hawkins, Director Emeritus of Arkansas State University Heritage Sites, and Paula Miles, the former Assistant Director at ASU Heritage Sites, who's now retired. Uh, these two work together, I think, for 30 plus years. So they will put on um, a very good webinar next month. I invite you to join us. Okay, and finally, please follow us on social media and I'd invite you to go to our website at preservearkansas.org to learn more about our organization and support us year round by becoming a member of Preserve Arkansas. Thank you all for watching. Have a good rest of your day. Bye.